You know, Australian research shows that most people with cancer want to talk about end-of-life care, but these discussions are largely occurring with family and support people and not with their doctor. It highlights important questions around when the sensitive topic of end-of-life planning should be raised in cancer care. Dr Sonia Fullerton is a palliative care consultant at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and co-author of the study, and she joins me now. Dr Fullerton, are these patients saying that they do want to have this discussion with their doctor? That's right. According to the research that we've recently published, it seems that patients with cancer and their carers do want to have these conversations in order to retain control over their care and also to have some discussions about end of life care. And how important is this and to what extent or how much detail is there in these discussions and, and plans? So in all of these discussions, we need to tailor it to what the patient and their support person want to know and what's relevant for them. So I find that when I'm talking with patients about these issues, some people would like a really detailed discussion and other people would just like to have an indication about the sorts of treatments that they could have or that they might not want to have. So it's not a one size fits all. Uh, are doctors hesitant to have these conversations and, and is that perhaps why? I am sorry to report that doctors are sometimes hesitant to have these conversations, but I do know why. I think that we're taught to expect that these conversations can be complex, can take a long time and can be upsetting to the person and their family. But actually, I do these conversations nearly every day and I don't find that to be the case. What we really want people to think about is if you were very unwell, and you couldn't make decisions for yourself about what treatments you wanted or what treatments you didn't want, who should we talk to about that? And what would they say? So we're asking the person to nominate a substitute decision maker who could take over decision making if that person lost the capacity to make decisions. And we're also asking that that person has a good understanding of the patient's values because we only want to deliver treatment to the person that they want we don't want to give them treatment that they don't want and that won't benefit them. So there's no doubt, I mean, it is a sensitive uh, topic for discussion and therefore a sensitive subject to do research on. How did you conduct that? So we talked to 700 people with cancer or their carers across different demographics and different areas in Australia and they participated in an online survey and they answered a number of questions about their knowledge about advanced care planning and whether health professionals or other people had had conversations with them about particular things such as substitute decision makers or end of life planning. So essentially, um, and this is a, can come across as a jarring term, but it's patients talking about having a good death, uh, but and given the cards that they have been dealt in the circumstances, is that what it comes down to? So yes and no. So I'm a palliative care doctor, so I talk about a good death and dying a lot. But advanced care planning is not just about dying. It's about the person maintaining their own decision-making capacity. So say a person becomes very unwell and goes to the emergency department, sometimes people's decision-making capacity is impaired and we have to talk to a member of their friends or family about what decisions they might want to make. So it's not necessarily just about end-of-life care, it's about treatment choices that they might have. And patients, we know patients with cancer have very many treatment choices that they have to make um, along while they're being treated for cancer. And what happens if family members overrule those choices or try to? Oh, great question. So I think that's come from the media a little bit. Um, legislation in each state is different, but certainly um, when a person makes an advanced directive that says that, for example, they don't want a particular treatment, um, it's very difficult, nearly impossible for the family members to overrule a, a legally drawn up advanced directive. So if a patient signed an advanced directive that gave the instruction, I do not want CPR, even if the person's relative says to me, no, they can't talk and I'm going to take over decision making, I have to be very confident that that person is representing the wishes of a patient, patient who's ill. So it's not the case that relatives can just overrule the person who's made that decision. And so how and when uh, should people go about putting these decisions in order? So I think everyone should think about this. It's not just older people. It's not just people with cancer. You've got to, uh, we can think about it in terms of ACP. A is appoint a substitute decision maker. 
C is chat and communicate about your wishes. And P is put it on paper. So that's when you write an advanced directive. So certainly if you have a chronic illness such as cancer or another illness, it's a great idea to talk about these things. But bad things can happen to many people at any time. So the example I've been using obviously a lot recently is if you got COVID and you went to the emergency department and you were so unwell that you couldn't talk to the doctors about what treatment you wanted or you didn't want, who would speak for you? So I think it's a good idea for us all to think about these issues. It could be a good time around the Christmas dinner table actually to have chats with your family about the sorts of treatments that you might want or that you might not want if you got very sick. Dr Sonia Fullerton, a co-author of this study and a palliative care consultant at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Thank you. Thank you.